slopes of Ben Bulban. One of the men who died had two brothers serving in the Free State Army. He, though, had gone against the treaty. His name, Brian McNeil, a young university student from Dublin. Most remarkable of all, perhaps, Brian McNeil's father was the Minister for Education, Owen McNeil. Brian's sister still recalls the day the family learned of his death. They were surprised when they came into the avenue that my father was standing on the doorsteps. They were up a couple of steps, about seven or eight, and waiting for them. And when they got there, he said to my mother, Taddy, I want to talk to you. And the pair of them went into the study. And that was when he broke the news about Brian? And that Brian. was when he broke the news about Brian. My mother was desperately shattered. Again, amongst eight children, we always reckoned she had two favourites. Not that she wasn't nice to the rest of us, but Brian, who was a blonde, and Moira, who was a blonde. And these were her pets. And what I heard was that she was utterly shattered. Remote mountain regions were now the only refuge for the anti-treaty activists as the civil war dragged mercilessly on. Mostly, this was due to one man. Liam Lynch was the leader of the IRA executive and remained fanatically opposed to any surrender or ceasefire, despite overwhelming evidence that the anti-treaty cause was hopeless. Moves within the IRA leadership to end the fighting failed to impress Lynch. Equally, he paid little heed to de Valera, treating him as just another soldier. In March 1922, at a meeting of the IRA, deep in Lynch's stronghold territory of the Nair Valley in North Waterford, in this farm cottage, he persuaded his weary commanders to fight on. His uh, whole judgment must have gone, because when he was traipsing around the Knockbill Downs a few days before he was killed, and he only had a handful of people supporting him and the war had virtually finished, he still was writing to people to say that they would win in the end if they held out. I think the war should have been concluded by Lynch in December of 1922. Uh, I think it was a mistake to carry on because uh, he, he, it must have been aware to him and his other commanders that they were beaten on the field. All major towns, the entire country was occupied. There simply was no reason to go on. And uh, I think he made a mistake that by withdrawing to the hillsides and the valleys that he could have continued a, a sort of war that they conducted against the British, and that simply wasn't done. Lynch's death, like that of Collins, was a critical moment in the Civil War. He had been the embodiment of the anti-treaty position throughout the conflict. Idealistic, impractical, almost spiritual in his devotion to the Republican cause. In Liam Lynch's world, death had to come before dishonour. For the country as a whole, Lynch probably had to die before this pointless war could be brought to an end. Lynch personified all that was honest and decent, and that it was no wonder that he took the path that he did, because he couldn't live with compromise, he couldn't live with the new free state. De Valera wrote when he heard of his death, he wrote that Liam Lynch threw himself across the stampede of a nation. Even Lynch, whose memorial stands today in the Knockmeal Down Mountains, might have realised that no other outcome was possible. Peace terms offered by the IRA were rejected by the government. One minister remarked that there's not going to be a draw with a replay in the autumn. The futile mountain guerrilla campaign ended with a ceasefire in May 1923. No arms were handed in, they were merely dumped. Dave couldn't take it seeing Irishmen killing Irishmen. And he called a halt one. And I can always remember my brother coming in that night, in from where they were, out in the wheel somewhere. And he sat down in the chair and cried his heart out. What did they do? What did we fight for? And after a bit, he took out his revolver, and with my younger brother, they went out to the garden and buried the revolver. Dave told him, 
prepare him for another time. It's in some future time, it would start again. And we would win through. Much more than guns were buried after Ireland's civil war. In Dublin's Glasnevin Cemetery lie the remains of hundreds of free state soldiers, largely forgotten victims of the madness from within. No one knows how many people died in the nine months of fighting, certainly thousands. And it was rarely a conflict blessed by chivalry and honour. This was a poisonous and very typical civil war, potmarked by brutality and atrocities, particularly in Kerry in the final throes of the fighting. At Knocknagoshal in March 1923, six Free State soldiers died in a booby trap explosion. The next day at nearby Ballysidi, eight anti-treaty prisoners were strapped to a landmine by their Free State captors and blown to pieces. The military options so heavily exercised at the birth of the Irish Free State left little to recommend them. But giving in to the violence of the IRA in 1922 could have produced an even greater catastrophe. Politics tragically failed to deliver also, most notably in the figure of the anti-treaty side's chief political apologist. And how well does the record now stand of those who succeeded Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins? Was anything genuinely achieved by so much bloodshed? I think there were real problems with the Free State. I think they excluded groups. I think it was um, a very, sometimes they had a very narrow outlook. Their attitudes towards women leave a lot to be desired. But in terms of establishing the state on a firm democratic footing, I think we have to give them full marks. The fact that you have disturbance and an unres unresolved constitutional position 75 years on, that is evident evidence that the treaty settlement was inadequate in the first place and didn't stand the test of time. So, in fact, I, I would contend that they both got it wrong. The treaty settlement was a poor settlement. The state had been founded and therefore it was wrong to rise against the state, against your fellow Irishmen. They didn't alter the border by a millimetre. It was one of the most useless wars ever fought since uh, Swift wrote about the big enders and the little enders having the row over which end of the egg should be topped. I think it has been proved right since. There's about three or four thousand killed since up in the north of Ireland between policemen and civilians and everything else. Whereas it was all settled at that time, you wouldn't have that now, would you? You'd, you'd, and you'd have a great country. However great a country Ireland may now be, Several basic political and constitutional questions remain unsettled 75 years after the Civil War. The, the, the modern IRA claims a direct line of descent from the men and women who opposed the treaty in 1922, still a minority claiming to represent the Irish people by force of arms if necessary. We may have learned.